Dear friends, I am Dr. K. Kandan, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Coordinator Teaching Learning Center, Care College of Engineering, Prichy. Uh, this is the second lecture in the series, lecture series. The topic is Understanding Learning Process. So, first, to, first of all, what is learning? So, what is the definition for learning? Learning is a process that leads to change, which occurs as a result of experience and increases the potential for improved performance and future learning. I have marked with the red color, three letters with the red color, process, change and experience. So the order is, learning is a process which necessarily gives some experience to the learner and because of the experience, there will be change in their attitude or behavior. So that is what the purpose of the learning. Learning is a process that leads to change which occurs as a result of experience and increases potential for improved performance and future learning. So learning is a process, not a product. The process takes place in the student's mind. We can only infer that it has occurred from the student's product or the performance. So it is a process. We can infer that the process has occurred in the student's mind only by understanding or only by seeing their product or the performance in the test or the examination or performance in the classroom or a product at the end of a practical class or a project demonstration. So learning involves change. So learning involves change in the knowledge, change in the belief of the student, change in the behavior, behaviors of the student or attitude of the student. There should be some change because of the learning, there should be some change in the student. Learning is not something done to the student, but rather something students themselves do. So learning today in the outcome-based education concept, today environment, the learning is student-centric. The students are responsible for learning. So student is learning is not something done to the student, but rather something students themselves do. It is a direct result of how students interpret and respond to their experience. So there should be some experience. Out of experience only they can learn. That is why today it is called as experiential learning. So we learn. We learn through five sense organs. We know we know the science. Whatever we uh, claim as knowledge or the experience, it is only through the five sense organs. The information acquired through the five sense organs. Among the five sense organs, the, the sight, what we see, the eye, organ eye, right? The 83 percent through the sight. So remaining are very meager. So, in the teaching learning process inside the classroom or for the cognitive learning process, hearing and seeing, they are most important. And what we remember. So, we learn through the hearing and sight majority of the time. What we remember, 20% what we hear, 30% what we see, and 50% what we see and hear, 80% what we say, and 90% what we say and do. So, what we say and do or what we say, they are major. So, we remember only when we do something with that information, only when we repeatedly say the information. So, repeatedly we have to say. Normally, for remembering the information, we have to teach the students three times. So, that is the basic principle. Three times you have to tell the student, then only the student can Remember the information. So the five sense organs, what is happening in the, what is the cognit cognitive process happening in the mind during the learning process? So learning, the inf new information from the sense organ, it is received by the sense organ and the information is encoded by the sense organ and the information goes to the sensory register, a small memory where the information is stored. Then the information goes to the working memory. So sensory memory and the working memory. So in the first two four steps, there is a possibility of 
the loss of information. So when the information is not properly processed or used, then from the working memory, the information is stored in the long term memory. So when the information is stored in the long term memory, we can retrieve it for the future use. But today, the in this generation for the students, the main problem is storing the information in the long term memory. So they are not able to remember the information for examination. They are not able to write and remember and write the content in the examination. That is the main concern. So how to store the information in the long term memory? So we understand the process using the Atkinson Schifrin model of memory. So there are three types of memory, three different levels of memory in our human brain, sensory memory, short term memory and long term memory. When the sensory input received by the mind, sense, senses, then it is given to the sensory memory. When the In the sensory memory, when the information is not processed, the information is not transferred and it is lost. So this is there will be loss and uh, the a memory information goes to the short term memory. So what is sensory memory? A short brief sensory event such as sight, sound and taste. So these are, I said, sound what we hear, sight what we see and taste small fraction. So the event, these are all the event connected with the uh, sight, sound and the taste. It is very brief storage, so up to two seconds. But the problem with the mind is we are constantly bombarded with the sensory information. We cannot absorb all of it or even most of it. So sensory memory, so when we travel in the bus or when we sit inside the classroom, the teacher is continuously talking. So there is bombardment of information. So the information we cannot absorb, student cannot absorb almost all the information. So only fraction of the information, it goes to the short term memory. So what is happening in the short term memory? So short term memory takes place, takes the information from the sensory memory and sometimes connect that memory with the something already in the long term memory. So the, this is here, here the information is processed. Normally it is compared with the previous information in the long term memory. If the information is relevant, then the information goes to the long term memory. Right, and the here again, the, there is a lot, there is a possibility of loss of information when it is not properly processed. So here we require lot of rehearsal. So repeatedly we have to use the information. So rehearse the information, process the information, then it is being stored in the long term memory. So here the short term memory, the storage lasts in twenty seconds. So the time for the process is twenty second. Within the 20 seconds, we have to process, we have to compare and it is to be sent to the long term memory. So long term memory is a continuous storage of information. There is no storage capacity, limit of storage capacity. So we can store any amount of information in the long term memory. There are two types of memory here, explicit memory and implicit memory. Explicit memory, thus we can't consciously try to remember and recall. So for example, during exam preparation, we consciously try to remember the information that is what explicit memory and the implicit memories are, it is, it is not due to the consciousness, it is because of the behavior. So memory formed because of the behavior. Then the neuroscience, today there are a lot of research on the neuroscience to understand the functioning of the human brain, especially how it learns. So this new knowledge has forced us, the educationists to be revisit and review the existing teaching practice. So learning, research tells us, learning happens when the brain creates new neural connections. Active learning intervents, intervention promotes creation of new neural connections and retention of long-term memory. The brain processes the information in small chunks. So repetition enhances the long-term memory. So when you use the information repeatedly, it will enhance the long-term memory. Emotions strengthen the memory. So when you have when you have emotions connected with the subject, it will strengthen the memory. Our brain are programmed to focus only on the new and the unusual input. So regular input repeatedly without any voice modulation, if the information is uh, given to the student, 
delivered to the student that will not be focused, that it will not be focused by the mind. So, unusual new inputs are required. Social interaction promotes the learning. So, these are all the some of the researches. So, for that, we have seven powerful strategies. First one, deliver the content in small chunks. So, 50 minutes lecture, it can be divided into five segments. So, first five minutes, previous lecture review or day's objective. Second, 15 minutes, segment one, one of the today's topic. Second, 10 minutes, a short assessment or activity in between. And uh, then, then again, 15 minutes, the second part of the lecture portion of this particular today's topic. And the finally, 5 minutes, summing up the takeaway, key takeaway points in, in the particular class. So, when you split into 5 segments and deliver the lecture, so the students can easily understand and receive the information. Then, make the content relevant. So, whenever possible, connect the content to the real world. So, we have to give examples from the real world. So, this is possible for most topics in engineering, which is so closely linked to the life. So, we can engineering, it is very, very much possible. And the plan implementing group activities. So, pair, small group or large group. So, we have to plan group activity. So, group activity will promote better learning. Embed assessment in every instruction. So, every class, there should be some assessment procedure. So, the this will ensure regular review and reputation leading to the enhanced students' performance and confidence. Provide constructive feedback. If they are doing better in the assessment process or when they are behaving properly in the classroom or responding pro effectively in the classroom, you have to give the positive and constructive feedback. So, positive reinforcement is said to be one of the most powerful tools for motivating the students. So, partner with the technology. Use different strategies, technologies, options wherever possible. Make yourself accessible. So, encourage them to communicate with you, email or other tool, WhatsApp, WhatsApp. Support the shy and the weaker students to develop the content. So, when you practice these seven steps, in your daily lecturing, it will improve the better learning and understanding of the subject by the student. So, there are many uh, statements. So, Confucius uh, said, I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do and I understand. So, the main objective of today's classroom lecturing is make the, make the student to understand the subject. So, that is possible when you provide some experience inside the classroom. So, experiential learning inside the classroom. So, for that, they have to do something with the subject. Either they have to make some discussion, they have to do some numerical ex ex exercises, or do something with the subject. So, participate the student in the teaching learning process so that they can understand, they will have some experience with the subject and they can understand the subject. So, thank you very much for your listening. If you have any queries, you can contact me through mail ID or WhatsApp. I will clarify all your doubt. So, thank you once again. We'll meet again.